It's great to have you with us today. Thanks so much for being here. You can see we're back on the stage. Wilson is here with me. He has made it known to me that he refuses to come out unless we are on the stage. So happy to have Wilson with us. Happy to have you with us as well. Hope you'll go ahead and take out your message outline for today. As you do that, last week we looked at a very famous Bible verse found in Philippians 4, 13. In that verse, Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Some people have taken that verse, and I refer to it as the Superman verse. It's the idea that that verse tells me that whatever I do, that, you know, I'm going to be successful because God's going to help me through it type of thing. But when we looked at that verse in its context last week, we saw what it really was saying is that God will help us handle whatever difficult situation we happen to encounter. Today, we're going to be looking at another well-known verse in Philippians 4.19, where Paul writes, My God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And just like verse 13, this is a verse that's often misunderstood and taken out of context. It leads us to remember a very important principle as it relates to Scripture. It's the first fill in the blank on your message outline. To fully understand scripture, it's important that we know the context of a passage or verse. The context simply refers to the verses before it and the verses after it, the verses that surround it, so to speak. It's almost like a contract. When you get a contract, and we've all had them, you need to make sure you read the large print, but we also need to read what? The fine print as well. If you saw my last Friday's uh, spiritual thought of the day, then you're well aware of the problems that we had last week with our hot water heater. Only seven months old, but it sprung a leak, and we walked out to find our garage with water flowing through it. We contacted the manufacturer. They said, send some pictures, and we did. And one of the pictures we sent, our hot water heater had a thing that maybe you've seen, maybe you hadn't, but it's called a circulation pump. Now, this one's on the top of the hot water heater. Ours actually was on the bottom. But when they looked at that picture, they said, you know what? That thing was not properly installed according to their instructions, and therefore our warranty was suspended. Now, I thought that meant that we're going to be on the hook and we're going to buy a brand new hot water heater, which I was not excited about. But when we did what they asked, we actually literally took it off, connected everything up, and sent pictures back. They said, well, we're going to reinstate your, your hot water heater warranty which was great and eventually things worked out uh, fine they replaced our hot water heater and we were delighted about that but the point that i want to make is this i would have never guessed that little fine print that somewhere in there said that if we don't install exactly the way they want our warranty might be null and void on the same way if you and i do not understand scripture especially in its context we can pretty much make the bible say almost anything we want to by taking verses out of context let me give you a very common example of this a very popular verse that you're probably well familiar with is romans 8 28 the verse tells us we know that god causes all things to work together for the good of those who love god and are called according to his purpose now my guess is just like me there have been many times you've used this verse to encourage someone who's going through a difficult time. And the verse does say, we know that in all things, God, God causes all things to work together for the good. But what we fail to understand and leave off are the qualifiers. It says, that's true for those who love God. So this verse obviously wouldn't apply to someone who's not even a follower of Christ. But he adds another qualifier to it. He says, it's for those who are called according to God's purpose. He's referring to someone who is actively walking with God in their relationship with him. So a person who's just kind of, you know, I pop in and out of church once or twice a month, that verse really would not be applied to them. My guess is this, that if you've ever had a letter from this government agency, IRS, you probably took the time to read it. And if it wasn't addressed to you, which would probably be a good thing for you, maybe it was addressed to your spouse, maybe to one of your older children, you probably read that letter over their shoulder as they were reading it. It leads us again to this next fill in the blank. As we look at the passage for tonight, or today rather, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 through 19, look at this fill in. We need to remember the older to over the shoulder principle. It's the idea that as we are reading this letter written to the church at Philippians, it, Philippi, it was a real letter written to real people. 
And so we need to understand, first of all, what did it mean to them in their context? Then we can step back and we can begin to think and look, how does this apply to me in my everyday life? Again, Paul wrote this letter to a church he had started about 10 years earlier in the Mediterranean city of Philippi, northern Greece, if you would. Paul's now in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to be executed or if he's going to be set free. The church in Philippi sent a financial offering to Paul while he was in prison. A man by the name of Epaphroditus delivered it, who stayed on with Paul kind of as an assistant to him. So Paul, in this letter, is basically writing a thank you note back to this church. We're at the end of the letter now. Hear what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 through 19. Paul says this, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, which is where the region where Philippi was, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, a city very close by, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account, that God would bless you because of what you've done. Verse 18, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And here's the promise, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice several things about this passage of Scripture. Here's the first one. Notice that the Philippians had, first of all, generously supported Paul's ministry. In verse 15, Paul says, except you only. They were unique in the sense that they were the only church that had financially supported Paul. No one else had done this. And then later on in verse 18, he says, I have more than enough. I am amply supplied by what you have done. This is a very strong statement in which they are saying that not only had a, they helped Paul, but they had generously supplied him and supported his ministry. A second thing to note is this. This had been done from the beginning. In other words, when they were just brand new Christians. And he talks about when he was in Thessalonica. If you remember, way back several weeks ago when we began this series, we looked in Acts chapter 16 to see how this church began. Paul went to the city of Philippi, expecting to find a Jewish synagogue. But there were so few Jews in Philippi that there was no, uh, no synagogue to be found. On a Sabbath, though, he went outside the city down by the river and found a group of women who were there, Jewish women who were there praying. He begins to dialogue with them and tell them that the Messiah they'd been longing and waiting for was actually Jesus Christ, who had come and how he had died on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins. They decided to begin to follow after Jesus Christ. They became Christians. And so this church was birthed at that time. It was a small group, essentially. They met in a woman's home named Lydia. Paul stayed there a while longer teaching them. But then he ran into some trouble with the law. He was actually put in jail for teaching about Christ. He was beaten up. And then when he was finally allowed to get out, they escorted him out of the city. They forced him to leave. From Philippi, he went to this city of Thessalonica. So when he says, for even when I was in Thessalonica, this is, again, just weeks after he had left their city. These brand new Christians, as soon as Paul was literally leaving, said, how can we help you advance the kingdom of God? So they had done this from the beginning. The third thing to remember is this. They had done this over the long haul. Again, this church had been established 10 years ago, a decade ago, and Paul says, you sent me aid more than once. This phrase, more than once, suggests the idea of doing something again and again. Throughout this time, they had supported Paul. So we look at this and just kind of put these three things together. What we see had happened with these Philippian Christians, they had generously supported Paul's ministry. They had done this from the very beginning of their relationship with Christ, and they had done it over the long haul. After this, now notice what comes next, and, and. The word and simply refers to because of that, because of these things that we had just talked about. Here's the promise that God would meet all of their needs. 
Look at the next fill in the blank on your outline. This small little word and in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written in, it literally means this. It's the Greek word is the word day, and it means because of. So Paul, again, is referring back to what he's previously said, because they had done these things that God was going to meet their needs. I want you to know this. This is not a blank promise that he makes to them. It's not that if you're a Christian, it's saying that all your needs will be met. Just like Romans 8, 28, there were some conditions that Paul laid out. And God is saying, because you did this, God is going to do this. Let's look now at the promise. Two things to remember. First of all, the promise is that God would meet their needs and our needs, but not necessarily our wants. If we were here together, I would have us do a collectively big, big bummer statement right here, because wouldn't it be nice if God said, I'll meet your needs and also your wants? Now, if you're a parent, you certainly understand this. Your child would be happy with sugar and candy all the time, wouldn't they? But you know, as a parent, you've got to mix in some fruit and veggies as well. There are times when our children think they need to stay up all night. Times they think they don't need to brush their teeth. Times that they, need, that they feel like they need to have a toy every time they go into a store. But as a parent, you know and you do not supply your child with everything they think they need and certainly not everything that they want. Would you agree that often the very things that we try to escape are the things that we need in order to grow in our relationship with Christ? And along that same line of thought, wouldn't it also be true that sometimes what God sees that we need in our lives may even be a problem or a hard time? The promise that he makes here is that there will not be a time in your life or my life when we have a genuine need, not a want, but a genuine need that God is not there to meet that need in our life. But have you ever noticed this? Look at the next fill in. That when God meets our needs, he has this unique just-in-time delivery system. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, sometimes you'll even, we can even get mad at God, and you'll often hear people, Christians, say this. We'll say, well, God hasn't met that need in my life yet. But God always shows up on time. Look at the next fill in the blank. This verse is also telling us this that God meets our needs according to, not just out of, God's riches. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, let's do a pretend real quick. Let's say that you are a waiter or waitress in a nice restaurant, and a celebrity, a star, if you would, came in to eat, and you had the good fortune to be assigned to wait at their table. Maybe when they came in, you were so jacked up that you're going to get to serve them, but you were also especially excited because of the tip you would probably get. Maybe it was Tom Brady who came in. That'd be pretty neat. Or maybe LeBron James. Or maybe it might be a movie star like Tom Cruise or a, a, a singer like Lady Gaga. And so you served them and you did well. And then afterwards, when it came time for your tip, would you rather that they give you uh, uh, out of their wealth, or would you rather give them in accordance to their wealth? If they gave you out of their wealth or out of their riches, they may say, well, you know, a normal tip's 20% or whatever. I'm going to give you 30 35%. That's a great bump up, but you would be bummed out because you knew if they gave you in accordance to their wealth, they are loaded. And I don't know about you, but I've read stories about how some of these celebrities have given waiters, waitresses, tips like $1,000 or something like that because that would be in accordance to really what kind of money they actually have. What Paul is saying is this, that there is a lavishness when God meets our needs according to his riches, that our God, our Heavenly Father, is not stingy. That's the promise. So let's spend our remaining few minutes here talking about what does this passage mean in its context to us? What does it mean to us today? The main principle, if you get nothing else, I want you to walk out with this principle, understanding this. It's the next fill in the blank for you. Here, get this. If you want this Philippian-like security, you and I need Philippian-like generosity. If you want that security, then we need to have that same generosity these Philippian Christians demonstrated. And please understand that this type of generosity, it helps to advance the kingdom of God. There are many great causes out there that tug on our heart, many that deserve our support. But what Paul is writing about is the advancement of God's kingdom, 
about God's agenda. So what does this Philippian-like generosity look like? Let me give you three characteristics. The first one is this. It means giving to God off the top. In other words, we give to God part of our income before we pay our bills and our other things, and we see what we have left over. Paul said in verse 15, it was in the early days of our acquaintance that, uh, that with our gospel that you began to do this. Again, we mentioned this earlier. From the very get-go, they began to support Paul. It wasn't when they had retired. It wasn't when they had built up a nest egg or built up security. In fact, we're going to see in a moment, they were incredibly poor. They lived in a culture at that day and time where women didn't have money, and most of the church members were women, They only a few men. But yet they found a way to give off the top to God. Philippians 11, or rather Hebrews 11, 6 tells us this. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God, two things he says. First of all, must believe that God exists. Second of all, that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now the very fact that you're watching this uh, this message online, you probably have no trouble believing God exists. But then look at that second thing. Do you earnestly believe God rewards those who seek him? The kind of faith we're talking about here, the kind of faith these Philippians had, there was no real doubt. They knew that if they stepped out in faith, God would reward them. In the same way, when you and I choose to obey God, maybe it's to forgive someone, maybe it's to help someone physically, maybe it's to help someone financially, that God would reward that. And the writer of Hebrews says, without that kind of faith, it's impossible to please God. Sadly enough, most Christians give to God out of their leftovers. Look at this next fill in the blank. If I give to God out of my leftovers, while there's a measure of thanksgiving, there is no faith involved in that giving. Why? Because I've already taken care of everything else first. I'm simply giving out of my leftovers. It requires zero faith. It is when you and I choose to advance God's kingdom first rather than taking care of everything else first that there is a measure measure of faith that's involved in our giving. Look at this next fill in the blank. Our giving is to be an expression of thanksgiving for what God has done for us and faith and trust for what he will do in our future. It's a way of saying, God, thank you for what, how you have provided for me, but also we thank you too for what you're going to, how you're going to provide in the future. On your outline, you see Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. I want you to know that this passage is written primarily to farmers. In Jesus' time, or a time when this was written, they were primarily an agricultural society. There were no corporate jobs. There was no monthly paycheck. And notice what he writes here. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth. And then notice this phrase, with the first fruits of all your crops. What were the first fruits? It was the first of the harvest. It was the idea that they were to honor God with the first as a way of saying thank you to God for what you provided and trusting God to provide for them in the future rather than waiting and seeing how much harvest came in and then giving God some of the leftovers. Then he goes and he says this, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. The principle here is that God, we're to honor God first, not with our leftovers. Now, let me be honest with you. You probably have heard some of this teaching. There's some people who've taken this passage and made it into an investment strategy. It's kind of like the bigger bigger shovel investment strategy. It's the idea that when we take our little shovels and we shovel something we have out and we give it to God, God has these great big shovels and he shovels more back to us and we do that for the long haul, then we're going to become rich because of it. We said this numerous times before. I want to say it again tonight on our, at our, during our time together. Look at this fill in. That proverbs are statements about how things in life generally work. They are not absolute promises. In fact, the opening words of the book of Proverbs in Proverbs 1.1, it says these are the proverbs of Solomon, not the proverbs. They are statements of wisdom about how life generally works. If you don't regularly read Proverbs, you're missing out. You should read. You get great wisdom from those. And when you read Proverbs, you'll constantly see how the wisdom writer says the righteous, the godly, that God cares for and good things happen to them and the wicked gets what should be coming to them. But we know in real life that's not always the case. 
In fact, it almost seems sometimes like the reverse is true. It's like the wicked are prospering and the righteous are not. We all know how some of the righteous have died young and the wicked seem to live to a ripe old age. But we realize they will get theirs one day. But Proverbs show a pattern of how life generally works. If a hundred people took the challenge of Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, and we honored God with our first fruits of our income, probably 80, 90 percent would experience what the writer says, our vats would overflow. But on the other hand, we have to be honest and say there'd probably be some who would have Job-like experiences. If you're not familiar with Job, his story's found in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. He was a very godly man who deeply loved God and followed God, but he had all kinds of problems in his life. These, again, are statements how life generally works. This is not an investment strategy, but it does point out how God values giving off the top and not our leftovers. The majority of people, when we give off the top, will experience the bigger shovel. But if by chance you don't, it's not meaning that there's something wrong with your faith. It's not that God has let you down. It's simply telling us that not all of our rewards will come on this earth that many will will come in heaven. The promise of Philippians 4, 19 is this, that if we are generous towards God, he indeed will meet our needs. But sadly, many Christians don't experience this security because we give out of our leftovers and not off the top. Here's a second characteristic of this Philippian-like generosity. It is done over the long haul. It is done over the long haul. Again, over and over, we see these Philippians sent offerings to Paul. Here's so often what can happen to us in our giving towards God. What we do to advance God's kingdom, fill in the blank for you, is often driven more by emotions than by commitment. Instead of building commitments in our life that we live off of, so often we will give when we hear some emotional appeal. Maybe it's off of TV. Maybe it's a special speaker comes to our church and talks about what their ministry is. And often we'll do this for several times. We'll give emotionally. But then there comes a point in time where usually we say, you know what, other people need to step up and give. I'm not going to do it this time because we experience a little bit of burnout. I want you to know that what these Philippian Christians were doing, they were giving out of their commitment to God's agenda, not some emotional response or when needs came up. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul writing to the Christians in the ancient city of Corinth speaks about this idea of giving out of commitment versus needs. The early Christian church was birthed out of Jerusalem, but it wasn't long after that that they suffered a great persecution from the Romans, so much so that many fled the city for their lives. Those who remained were reduced to abject poverty. So Paul and other Christian leaders were taking an offering among the other churches that had been started in that Mediterranean region, and they were bringing that money back to help these Christians in Jerusalem. Paul writes in his letter to the church at Corinth these words, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. He says, now your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem. You should follow the same procedure I gave the churches in Galatia. Galatia is not a city, it is a region. So Paul is saying as we went and we taught in these churches in this area, we gave them a pattern, if you would, on how to collect and how to do, do this money. And here it is. He said, on the first day of each week, referring to Sunday, you're at church, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. He talks about kind of a sliding scale, a percentage type of giving, if you would. He said, don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. But I think the Bible teaches, and Paul teaches us here, that we need to be percentage givers, that we need to look at how much God has blessed us. You say, well, why is that? Because one person may give, let's say they gave $100, and for them it would be a great sacrifice. For another person, it would be just a tip to God. They should be, God has blessed them much more than that type of a thing. So but it needs to be a regular habit off the top. And Paul says here, don't wait till I get there. Don't make me have to come up maybe with this emotionally spill about how poor these Christians are in Jerusalem and emotionally stir people to give. Take care of it on a regular basis so when I can come, I can just teach you more about Jesus Christ. I would also encourage you to remember the law of the harvest. Again, the context of this whole passage has been about security of God's protection in our life, not about finances. Again, this is not some investment strategy. 
But again, in the letter, a second letter he wrote to the Corinthians, Paul writes these words. He says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. We get that. If you're out and you throw a few seeds down, you get a few plants. You throw a lot of seeds down, you get a lot more. He goes on and he says this, you must each decide in your heart what to give. I love that. It's between you and God. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I hope you never feel pressure here at New Hope to give. If you do, don't give. That's what he's saying. He says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously, now notice this. This is almost exactly what he says in Philippians. And God will generously provide all you need. There it is again. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I hope you've not taken what we've talked about today as about guilting or manipulation. It's certainly not meant to be that way, but this is simply what God's Word is teaching us in this letter of Philippians. It is about getting in touch with God, though, and what God wants you and I to do. Here's the third characteristic of this Philippian-like generosity, and it is giving sacrificially. Giving, giving sacrificially. I want you to know this next one on the blank is so true. These Philippian Christians, they were not rich, but one thing they certainly were, they were very generous. In fact, look at this next fill in the blank. We are told that they gave out of their extreme poverty. In other words, when they literally had really nothing to give, and the amount maybe they gave for that offering, maybe, maybe it was small amount, but percentage-wise, I guarantee you it was a great amount. And more important than that, it represented their heart and their commitment towards God. And it was huge. And that, more than anything, matters to God. 2 Corinthians, again, 8, 2 through 5, Paul talks about their motivation for giving. He says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy, and notice this, here it is, their extreme poverty, welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, they gave as much as, as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Notice this. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. It's almost like Paul is saying this. They were so poor, we told them, don't give. You need this for your own well-being. Don't give. And they pleaded and said, no, we want to be a part of this. And notice what they did. Paul says they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. There was their commitment. And then by the will of God to us also. The temptation that we face today is this. It's the temptation to give later on. When I have more, when I have more security, then I'm going to start giving. Look at this next fill in the blank. I believe this is true in most all cases. If you and I aren't generous to God's agenda now, you won't ever be even if you make the big bucks. There's going to always, always be things that come in your way that are going to prevent you from giving as you say that you and I want to give or as we know we probably should give. I'm so grateful that early in my Christian life, after I'd only been a Christian for a few weeks, I was a, going before a senior, going into my senior year of high school that summer. And after I became a Christian and committed my life to Christ, I can't remember who it was, can't remember the circumstances, but they told me, he said, you know, Russ, as a follower of Jesus, you need to give back to God at least 10% of what he's given to you. I thought, well, if that's what a Christian does, that's what I'm going to do. I was a lifeguard working at the public pool that summer. So every paycheck from then on, every time I got that, I would honor God with my tithe. Janie and I, after we met, shared the same belief in honoring God with our finances. It's something that's just been a part of our lives for all these years now, 38 years and going on forward for that, because we believe this is what God would have us do. This Philippian-like generosity, it's not about fundraising, but it is about becoming the person that God wants us to be so that God can work in us and through us to do all he wants to do. These Philippian Christians sacrificed because of their commitment to Christ. Look at this last fill in the blank. I just want to, a word of warning, beware of excuses and gifts that cost nothing. It's easy to give God things I no longer want or to give God my leftovers or to give God things that really don't cost me. Sometimes I hear people say this, well, I give God my time, and that's wonderful. We couldn't operate if you didn't, but there's something about the sacrificial giving of our finances because money is so near and dear to most of us. It's different than giving 
our time than giving also our finances. I've even heard people who are Christian workers on church staff who say, you know what, I make less money by because I work for a church than in secular society, so I don't have to give. And yet God commanded the Levites, the priest in the Old Testament, that they were to lead the charge in, being, in giving and that they were to give their tithe to God as well. So as leaders, we're the ones to be leading the way. Let me close simply by saying this, that if you and I want the security that these Philippian Christians have, and I don't know about you, but I want to know that God promises to meet every need I have in my life, then we need to understand this. We need to follow the example of these Philippian Christians. If you look at my next step today, I've only given you one, and here it is. Maybe today you would say, I will begin to be generous and honor God with my finances to advance his kingdom and to have the security that only he can give. Let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a generous God to us, that you have modeled to us in Jesus Christ your giving heart and how much you love us and all that you've given to us. I pray that we could learn from these Philippian Christians, people who didn't have a lot of money, and yet they put you first in their life, and they showed it even in how they handled their finances. And God, you used their sacrificial gifts to help others in Jerusalem, but also to support Paul. And we look back and we think, what might be different if they hadn't done that? As we know, Paul wrote almost 40% of the New Testament this man wrote. And one reason probably he was able to do that was the generous support of those Philippian Christians. Father, I thank you for the financial blessings that you continue to supply New Hope with. I pray that you would help us to always be good managers of the resources that you give us, that we would always use every penny in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. Would you work in us so that you can do in us what you want to do through us, and that is to make a difference in this world, to help people know how much you love them and that, God, could you use us to influence them towards a relationship with you that will change their lives for all of eternity. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.